The orbit stabilizer theorem says that we're letting G be a finite group of permutations on a set S. So the elements of G are one-to-one -one and onto functions from S to itself. They are permuting the elements of S. It doesn't say S is a finite set. Evidently, S could be infinite. But G, the group of permutations, the number of permutations that you've got is finite. The conclusion is that the order of G is the product of the orders of the orbit with the order of the stabilizer. For any I in S, I could be any element of S. So how do you prove this? Let's go ahead and study this, the proof in the book here. So the first thing is to use Lagrange's theorem. Lagrange's theorem says that if you take the order of G and divide by the order of the stabilizer, you're going to get the number of distinct left cosets. That was part of Lagrange's theorem. Lagrange's theorem says when you've got a finite group, the order of any subgroup divides the order of the group. The stabilizer of an element of S is a subgroup of G. So its order divides G. And moreover, if you can figure out what this fraction is, it does represent the number of left cosets. I haven't used this notation much. I think I used it once. When you go ahead and you take the order of your finite group and divide by the order of the subgroup you're talking about, that's also got a name and a notation. It's called the index of the subgroup, in this case, the stabilizer in G. And the special notation, uh, our book writes it like this. Kind of like absolute value signs where H is the stabilizer. I will tell you other books uh, make it a little different. They make it more like brackets, like this. Okay, but our book writes it like that. The index by definition is just the number of left cosets, which by the way is the same as the number of right cosets doesn't mean the left and right cosets are equal. That's normality. But the number of them is the same. The number of elements in the cosets, whether they're left or right, is the same. And again, it's called the index. And Lagrange's theorem that it says that is the same as this ratio. So because of that, it suffices, it's good enough to establish a one-to-one -one correspondence between the left cosets of the stabilizer and the elements of the orbit. Doesn't say that that one-to-one -one correspondence is uh, isomorphism. I mean, the orbit's not necessarily even a group. Typically, it's not a group. You're just after a one-to-one -one and onto function. A one-to-one -one correspondence means a one-to-one -one and onto function, actually. If you meant just one to one, you'd just say just say one to one. But when you say one to one correspondence, it actually means both one to one and on to. To def to do this, define a correspondence T, a function really, by mapping an arbitrary coset. Phi is an element of the group. Stabilizer is a subgroup. It's like your H. This is a left coset. To phi of I under T. So. Maybe to try to understand this better, you want to use this kind of notation. T is going to be a function from the left cosets, the collection of left cosets, I'm going to go ahead and just use H for short, of H and G, where H, again, is the stabilizer, just for the sake of convenient notation and not having to write the stabilizer every time. to the orbit of the element I, where G, under the group G of permutations. And again, this thing is the set of all outputs phi of I as phi ranges over G. It's a subset of S, the set on which G is acting. This is actually also related to chapter nine right here. That collection of left cosets, if you read ahead into chapter nine, 
has a special symbol and a special name. The special symbol is you write it as a fraction, quote unquote, not really a fraction. G divided by H, you actually say more commonly G mod H. And you call this thing a factor group. Actually, that's not a unique name. It's also known as a quotient group whose elements are left cosets and whose group operation, evidently it must be a group, is, uh, I'm not going to say yet. We'll save that for a little later. Doesn't talk about that factor group in chapter seven. Just says this is the left cosets of a, the collection of left cosets of H and G. The elements of this domain here are left cosets, sets themselves. And the formula here for T is that it's taking your arbitrary coset, T of, I guess I'll use the book's notation, T of, T of phi H, where again H is the stabilizer. We want to map it, this left coset, onto a unique element of the orbit. What's the only thing that makes sense to even try? Well, what is the orbit? Again, the orbit is the set of outputs of um, phi of i as phi ranges over g. For the fixed element i in s, what are the different outputs that you can get? The only thing that makes sense here is that we map it to phi of i. This will be an element of the orbit. Right? We've got an i, we've got a phi. That's the only thing that makes sense to try, even. But the question is, is this well-defined? That's the big question. Is this well-defined? And what does that even mean? What does it mean to be well-defined? Here's the key issue. Go back to equivalence classes. Equivalence classes have, you know, they, they partition us a set. And in each equivalence class, you have more than one element. Typically, you have different representatives of the same equivalence class. Cosets are equivalence classes. We talked about this. Under a certain equivalence relation. Again, to remind you, the equivalence relation was that A was equivalent to B if and only if A inverse B was in H. We saw last week, no, that was spring break, Monday, that that was an equivalence relation on G. It was reflexive, symmetric, and transitive. And it was equivalent to A equaling B, uh, AH equaling BH, the left cosets being the same. It was a property was that lemma about cosets, property of cosets. And that's related to this being well-defined. If we had a different coset representative, would we get the same answer? That's the issue. If BH equaled psi H, Does B of I equal psi of I? It better if this is going to be well defined. But does it? Well, let's continue looking at the book's proof. They use alpha and beta here instead of phi and psi. If you've got two cosets there, they're the same. That's like alpha H equals beta H. I wrote phi H equals psi H. 
we must show that, that implies the uh, alpha of i and beta of r are the same. <clears throat> How? Well, come back here. I'll go. Okay, I'll go ahead and use uh, the book's notation. If alpha h equals beta h, does alpha of i equal beta of i? Alpha e h equaling beta of h, just like over here, it's a property of cosets, implies alpha inverse beta is an h, which is the stabilizer. But what does it mean to be in the stabilizer? I guess I'm trying to go through this now without looking at the book's proof. That implies that alpha inverse beta, that function maps I to itself, right? In other words, alpha inverse of beta of I equals I. Without looking, what do you do at this point? Think about your goal. Apply alpha to both sides, right? Alpha of alpha inverse of beta of I equals alpha of I. But yes, this simplifies to beta of I. Because alpha and alpha inverse are inverse functions. That does it. That is what the book did. I showed an extra step. That shows the function is well-defined and, and you really do need to do that. It's an absolutely necessary part of the proof. The well-defined essentially does means, does the function make sense? Does this formula make sense? Because cosets can have different representatives I've got to verify that if I've got different representatives and alpha and a beta, that I get the same thing. Then you want to show T is one to one. It's actually a reverse of the argument that it's well-defined. Reversing the argument shows it's one to one. Suppose, let's go ahead and write it out here. Suppose, T of alpha H equals T of beta H. Suppose the outputs are the same, are the inputs the same? That implies alpha of I equals beta of I. Yeah, now apply alpha inverse to both sides. And you'll get I is alpha inverse beta of I, skipping the step there. In other words, alpha inverse beta is an H, which is the stabilizer. And that implies alpha H equals beta H. The left coset are the same. Yes, this is the reverse argument. <clears throat> is it on to? You do need to verify it's on to as well. One to one correspondence means not only one to one, but also on to. We conclude the proof by showing T is on to the orbit. Give me an arbitrary element of the orbit. Is there some cosec that gets mapped to that? Give me some J in the orbit of I, meaning J must equal phi of I for some phi. What coset gets mapped to J under T? Well, since phi of I equals J, it's probably phi H. Book uses alpha instead. There's some alpha where alpha of I equals J. Yeah, the formula for T then tells you that that left coset is what gets mapped under J. So it's on to, it's a one-to-one -one correspondence. These these two sets have the same number of elements. You could say their orders are the same, although the orbit again is not a subgroup. 
You could also say their cardinality is the same if you want to get a fan fancy word in there. Same number of elements. And that concludes the theorem because then you just multiply. This is equal to the order of the orbit and then just multiply both sides of the equation by the order of the stabilizer. It's a useful theorem. <clears throat> As you read through the rest of chapter seven, it's got some pretty cool applications. And not just to math, it's also mentioned that those applications apply to um, crystallography. You remember reading about that? What's crystallography? It's, it's where you're uh, studying molecules essentially by shooting lasers through them and you're trying to see symmetries that result. I think it's referred back to in chapter one, some applications of group theory to crystallography. Symmetry can be applied to chemistry essentially. 